Needless to say, the, the probably the biggest thing is the atom has a long history. So starting in about 400 BC, the f Greek philosopher Democritus is credited with coming up with this idea that if I were to take, for example, a piece of paper and tear it in half and keep tearing it in half, um, eventually you would come to a place where you would reach something that could not be divided anymore. That's what indivisible means. Um, there were, because the other alternative is eventually you get to something that is so small that basically it's made out of nothing. And he reasoned that for there to be something solid, there's gotta be something solid there. And there's gotta be a point at which you can't break it down anymore or there would be no solidity to nature. Pretty smart person, the Greeks. So it wasn't really until the 1800s that John Dalton comes along and he's doing work in the field of gases. Um, you could kind of think the steam engine and those kinds of things, but he's, he, he proposes um, Dalton's law, uh, which has to do with how gases work, which you'll learn a lot about in chemistry. But basically, part of his work was saying that matter has to be made of, once again, indivisible, which means you can't break it anymore, indivisible spheres called atoms. So he really took this idea and really solidified it. And it, his whole theory of how gases work really hinged upon this idea. Well, as they continue to, scientists continue to work with this idea, John Dalton wasn't wrong, okay? But as they experimented, J.J. Thompson comes along and he's able to create, um, pull electrons off of a particle. And it is not, he knows it's not the atom, it doesn't behave like an atom, and he says, these little things have to be charged. And what he said is an atom is a sphere and it has these negative charges in there somewhere. And there's gotta be some positive charge in there which cancels out the negatives. Think of it, he, they call it the plum pudding model, but you can almost think of it like a chocolate chip cookie where the cookie part is the positive stuff and the chocolate chips are the negatives. Um, but back then they called it the plum pudding model. Okay, so about 20 years later, Ernest Rutherford is doing work with um, radioactive material. And basically what he does is he shoots particles at a sheet of gold foil. And what he determines is the atom contains a small, dense nucleus made of protons. In other words, instead of this solid sphere, what he says is there's got to be a nucleus and there's got to be, well, the nucleus has to be positive and the negatives are out there somewhere. And the rest, the in-between space is empty space. So that's Ernest Rutherford came up with that. And I, there's a lot more detail we could get into and in chemistry, you will probably dive into that more, but we're, I just want to give you an overview of this. Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr is the model we're going to use. Um, basically, he said electrons orbit the nucleus made of protons, and the orbits have set specific energy. Now, this is probably more than anything else the reason why we use his model. Um, it's also easy to draw. So, in general, here's how I would write it. Protons are p-positive in the nucleus, and then we have the electron going around the outside around the outside, okay, and we've got our electron. And I write E negative for electron for short. We'll get to those particles in just a minute. In 1934, James Chadwick discovers the neutron. He says there's something else in the nucleus that has no charge, and he discovered that in 1934. Okay, so honestly, this is where we are probably gonna work only above this line in this class, because what happens next is quite complicated actually to understand, um, but it is what our current thinking on the atom. So long story short, um, Murray Gell-Mann and uh, Zweig discovered these particles in particle accelerators, and they discovered that quarks, or they proposed that the protons are made out of 
stuff, okay? And they call them quarks, okay? And they did this work in 1964 and in 1968. So 1964, they, they kind of discovered it. 1968 is when they proposed the idea. Um, so you'll notice here when we talk about the Higgs boson, it was actually proposed in 1965. It wasn't officially discovered until 2012. Okay, so all of this to say that there is the modern theory of the atom is called the standard model of the atom. It was developed in 1975. And if you will notice, 2012, we are still putting the pieces together. Okay, so I think the really cool thing about this for you to understand is two things. One, we're going to use the Bohr model. Two, Physics, if we understand physics properly, it is able to predict things that haven't been discovered yet. And then later, as our technology increases, as our understanding increases, we are able to discover those things. So Democritus even was able to come up with this concept of something that's indivisible, that matter must be made out of, but yet it hadn't been really discovered or talked about until 2200 years later. Okay, so that's the power of physics and scientific thinking. What I want to point out to you though is this model right here is a quite a bit different from Democritus's original idea of the atom. Okay, so let's, we could talk, I could talk all day about this, but let's jump into the Bohr model and kind of get into what we're really going to deal with as we go through this unit. So the Bohr model. The Bohr model has a nucleus, okay? And it's just the center part of the atom. And the red is positive. Here, let's change colors here. So the red is positive. The gray here are my neutrons and they're neutral. And then the blue here is my electron and they're negatively charged. Let's write that as a P positive, P positive and N zero. So an electron, and these, this should be a review for you at this point, but an electron is negatively charged and it orbits the nucleus in set orbits. So they're not just randomly flying out here. They have a set amount of energy and they travel in set orbits, okay? That's the Bohr model. There's actually different thinking on this, but the most important part is the orbits are energy levels. Okay, this is the birth of quantum mechanics right here. Electrons orbit with set energy. There's not a, it doesn't orbit in between. It doesn't go in between. It's either here or it's here and it jumps between the two without traveling through the inter, intermediate space. So it suddenly starts to break a bunch of the rules of physics here. Um, but electron is negative and it orbits the nucleus. So an electron is negative and it orbits the nucleus. Electrons determine the chemical properties and charge of the atom. When they're lost, gained, or shared, they can combine with, they cause the atom to be able to combine with other atoms. Um, and they also, once they're lost or gained, they either cancel out with a positive charge in the middle or they, um, are less than or more than, which means makes the atom positive or negative. Protons, positively charged, found in the nucleus, okay? Uh, it determines the type of chemical element, which is also known as the atomic number. So the protons actually tell us that this is hydrogen. If it's hydrogen, it has one proton, so that is hydrogen. If it has um, six protons, then you have carbon and not hydrogen. So the protons tell us what element it is. And carbon and hydrogen have very different properties. And that's because of this. The neutron is neutral charge. Neutron, neutral charge. And that's a fancy way to say it has no charge. No charge. And it's found in the nucleus. It determines the stability of the nucleus and is primarily responsible for radioactive decay. So radium, for example, it has too big of a nucleus and it starts to fall apart and we get radioactive stuff. 
And that's how we get x-rays is because when this falls apart, it produces lots of energy and it actually can allow you to take a picture of your, of the internal parts of your body. Okay. The in-between part here. So where this black space is, is literally empty space. There's nothing there and it's 99% empty space. So by extrapolation, you are made out of atoms, which are 99% empty space, which means that you are actually 99% empty space. Okay. So that's part of what we're going to get into is that how can I clap my hands together if my hands are actually mostly empty? The particles inside are empty. They should just pass through each other and they don't. So we're going to talk about that. You're going to learn all about this in chemistry. Hopefully you've had some exposure to the periodic table, but the periodic table lists all the elements in order by atomic number, which is the number of protons. So one proton, three protons, 21 protons, 42 protons, that kind of a thing. Okay. Um, there's, this is outlined so that you can actually figure out the, an atom's charge, how it's going to react with different things. You've got metals here in the middle, non-metals, you've got radioactive elements, you've got man, laboratory created elements, all kinds of stuff. Um, but you can look at this table and it will tell you all the uh, types of atoms that are out there that exist. And the biggest thing for you to know is that an atom of hydrogen, and this is why the atom is a big deal, because even though the atom is now divisible into smaller pieces, the atom itself determines how the material or the object that we're working with reacts with other things. So hydrogen is very different than sodium. Chlorine, which is actually a, a gas, or it could be a liquid, but it's a gas and it can be deadly to the human being. When we put it with salt or sodium actually, and we put those together and we actually get table salt. So, but that's all because of how the atom works. And in chemistry, you're gonna talk, you're gonna explore how that works in great detail. What I want you to understand is from a physics standpoint, that works because the atom is made of charged particles called the proton and the electron. 